All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, happy to be talking to an individual who's quite known as the promoter for the infamous Northern Death Tours in Manitoba, producing some great names including Chris Jericho, Edge, Christian, just to name a few. Also wrestled for the AWA, collected a few titles over the years. I'm talking to Tony Condello. How's your day going there, Tony? Yeah, thanks for asking. I'm doing really well, and uh, I like to talk about wrestling, I guess. That's where you're calling, and uh, I'm willing to do that for your station there. Yeah, also I'd like to talk about MMA a little bit later on, too. But right now I wanted to talk about the amateur wrestling experience you had early on there. It seemed like you had a few years under your belt and then turned pro, and you were shooting for some takedowns on the guy that you were working with, and then he kind of grabbed a headlock, and he's like, hey... This isn't like a prize fight. Was that the first time that you were smartened up to the business being a work? Exactly. That happened in Minneapolis, and uh, I went there for a ride, really. The uh, local wrestlers from Winnipeg said, Tony, come uh, for a ride uh, to Minneapolis. And uh, when I got there, uh, Wally Carbo and Vern Gagne said, hey, kid, you want to make $75? I said, do what? wrestle so i didn't cut me into wrestle i didn't know anything about professional wrestling that is i just came from the amateurs right but anyway they uh booked me against i says i got no i got no boots i got no trunks so the local guy says come on condello don't be a chicken we'll borrow you some pair of boots and a pair of trunks and that's what started so going to the ring now they booked me against a guy named lars anderson Six foot two, 250 pounds. Say, oh my God, what the hell am I going to, how am I going to beat this guy? That was my intention. <laughs> so anyway, we go inside the ring. The guy was a professional, very smart professional wrestler. He knew I didn't know anything about it, uh, professional wrestling, even the way I walked, right? So I go in the ring and I say, I'm going to take this guy down. So I got to go for his legs. And I did. Anyway, he goes down. I say to myself, I'm not that strong to put this man down, such you know, big guy like that. Anyway, he gets up and he puts me in a headlock and he says to me, Tony, this is not a price fight. Just do exactly what I tell you to do and everything is fine. That's when he smartened me up about professional wrestling. <laughs> we finished the match and that was it. Coming back to Winnipeg now, the episode from Minneapolis was showing on TV here in in, uh, in Winnipeg, and uh, the wrestling commission was his name was Jim Trubinoff, which you know has been passed away for many years now. He uh, says, "Hey, kid, always says, well, you wrestle professional, you got paid, you lose your amateur statics." So what are you talking about? If you want your amateur card back, you got to wait five years. At that time, I was seventeen years old, right? So at 17, you're not going to wait no five years for, for whatever. So Vern Gagne and uh, Wally Carbo said, uh, gain some weight to the time I weigh about 165 pounds, and uh, we'll use you, right? Uh, so I did. In a year and a half, I weighed 209. And they started booking me. Uh, I worked for Vern Gagne for 12 years under Tony Savoldi. I wrestled all over the States at that time. And back in 1972 now, I started my own... Uh, training here in Winnipeg and uh, promoting Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario. That's how I got started. <laughs> yeah, and a great legacy to be sure, but you touched on the fact you were with AWA for 12 years as Tony Savoldi, but then it seemed like there was a bit of a situation where uh, Vern Gagne ended up slapping Al Tomko, and then Tomko had mentioned that he said you were part of the Montreal Mafia, and then there was some residual heat after that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because that seems like a pretty wild series of events. At that time, on point, it happened in the Winnipeg Auditorium where Al Tampo was the front man for Vern Gagne. In those days, you know, there was no uh, computers like we have today. Uh, Vern uh, comes upstairs and he said that, uh, well, what kind of a figures are these? I think there should be more people there, right? And uh, blah, 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 they start blubbing away. And sure, he comes back. With, he came up with 750 extra tickets that he sold. He was plucking the money. He was a thief, eh, really. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, uh, God, the rest of his soul is dead now, but it's all he was as a thief. And uh, he got fired, really, at the end. So that's what happened. Yeah, and then it seemed like there was a series of events, too, where uh, there was a bit of a... AWA show with Wahoo McDaniel and Manny Fernandez that 
kind of ended anticlimactically, and then it seemed like a series of events took place whereby Vince McMahon kind of ended up becoming the guy in Winnipeg. Can you kind of touch on that saga a little bit there? Because that seemed like a curious interaction with Vince McMahon all throughout that. Well, that time I'm pouring, like I said, in 1973-74, you know, those years I was promoting Manitoba, and I'll never forget the town. The, the town was uh, Dauphin, Manitoba. I drew 2,003 people in records uh, with my local guys and some other people. But uh, all of a sudden, Al Tank was still tied up with uh, uh, Vern Gagne. He says, this kid is getting too powerful. So what does Vern Gagne do? He brings all his superstars to Dauphin, Manitoba, a town of maybe 4,000, 5,000 people, whatever it was, right? And uh, I went and I watched the show and I paid my $10 to get in. And what Vern Gagne did was, he had Andre the Giant there, all those big names. He killed, he killed that town. How you kill a town? Simply. Simple, you go in the ring, you don't wrestle. You, you get a guy in a headlock, you keep him there for five, ten minutes. So what happens to the crowd? They start booing you and booing and booing and booing. Anyway, he killed the town for me. But anyway, I went back to the Dolph of Manitoba about eight months later with a powerful uh, uh, card, the midgets, the ladies, and whatever. From 2,000 people, I drew 300. I never went back. So I made a promise to myself, one of these days, you millionaire idiot, greedy <laughs> son of a gun, so-and-so, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you good. That time came. Uh, got a call from uh, Vince McMahon. And he, he knew that I had a big beef with uh, Vern Gagne, yeah, a big grudge. And by this time in point, all the AWA wrestlers, they made a move with uh, to go to the WWF. They knew that I was the right guy that could get him the arena. That's what he called me about. Because Vern Gagne had a monopoly on Winnipeg Arena for over 30 years. 30 days before and 30 days after his, his contract read, and nobody can promote professional wrestling. So anyway, uh, McMahon, he wanted me to break that lease so he can come in and put, put Vern uh, out of his misery. Uh, and I did. I, I had a, a meeting with the, uh, uh, what do you call them, the uh, Enterprise. They used to run the business in the Winnipeg Arena. And of course, they had no rights to give an individual... Uh, uh, 30, days, 30 days before and 30 days after a monopoly on city property. That's how I got them. So anyway, they broke that lease and, in, in 24 hours. And uh, that was the end, actually. That was practically the end of, uh, of uh, Vern Gagne. But anyway, at that time, I, in point, I had uh, strong, uh, uh, powerful... Uh, TV station called CKY Television, which uh, in which ninety-eight uh, percent of Manitoba could see that channel. So later on, when uh, Vern Gagne was out of a business, he phoned me. Actually, Greg Gagne, his son, called me, and they want to they want to come back to uh, to Manitoba because they knew I had the uh, the television. But he forgot for what he did. Right. So we closed the deal. I brought him here for two matches. Uh, we did Winnipeg Rain and Brandon, and uh, my deal with him was I'll give you fifteen grand for two for two different events, which was pretty cheap, right? You pay your own you pay your own fare, whatever, right? And uh, it was Wahoo McDaniel main event with uh, Manny Fernandez, special guest referee Vern Gagne. Anyway, it was a cage match. Before the event, I told him, gentlemen, I'm going to tell you how to wrestle. You probably did this event a thousand times, but at least I want at least 12 minutes out of this event. So what happens now, the Vern Gagne, he put himself over by uh, giving him a shot to Money Fernando because he didn't want to break on the ropes, disqualifies him, and uh, the winner is uh, Wahoo McDaniel. Three minutes into the match. So what happens? People start booing, right? Bullshit, right? And stuff like that. So he, he, he screwed me one more time. Anyway, we are inside the dressing rooms. So Wahoo and, and uh, uh, Manny said, thank you very much for the match. So Mr. Gagne said, can I talk to you in a corner there? 
I said, we made a, an agreement, really, 12 minutes for the match. You give me three minutes because you're the referee, right? And blah, blah, blah. I says, I'm not going to pay you the other $7,500 because you screwed me one more time. I said, read your contract, I says, very closely and see what I'm talking about. He gets hot. I said, what are you going to do, my friend? You were once my friend, no anymore. Get your uh, big boys to beat me up. I says, I will, if I was you, I would think twice. Open that door, you will see three guys dressed in blue with a red tie. Those are my security. You touch me in any way, in any matter, and you're gonna, you're not gonna get away from the, this uh, dressing room alive. Simple as that. So you're fired. Tell your lawyer <clears throat> to get a hold of mine, and we sell this. And never heard no more. And that was the end of him. It was my pleasure to fire that guy, a multimillionaire at that time and point, for what he did to me. Yeah, I mean, just what a saga there. But earlier on there, you were talking about getting into promoting and everything like that. I understand Phil Fontaine in 1973 introduced you to the idea of the Northern Tour and kind of going in that direction. Okay. Phil Fontaine, very good a gentleman and a half. At that time, I, I think I don't think he was uh, the uh, head chief from uh, Monet, uh, Canada. Uh, but I think he was. I can't remember correctly. But anyway, he says, Tony, is I going to give you some new place to promote wrestling? they never seen professional wrestling alive in their community. I says, what the hell? What did I miss, right? And he gave me all his reservations up north where they never did see before. And uh, the only way you're going to get in there is fly in, which is a costly deal. But you got to wait for the winter roads and you travel through the uh, frozen uh, lakes and so forth. But he says, you're going to promise me one thing. He gave me a bunch of, uh, about 15, 20 of them. He gave me a bunch of names. I got a hold of them. And sure enough, we had a deal going. And uh, you got to promise me one thing. So when you get there, you got to talk to the kids and the people. Stay away from drugs, alcohol, all that stuff. And you know what? I kept my word up to date. I used to do maybe 200 different events a year. Like in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. But now the time came, you know, only lucky to get old. I do maybe 15 or 20. And I still do exactly what he told me to do. Yeah, and I mean, it seemed to be a formula that worked quite well. I mean, multiple decades under the belt, multiple tours. But I mean, one of the individuals he ended up training and just having them cut their teeth in general was, you know, Roddy Piper there, just wrestling in his first match, helping cultivate his gimmick and everything like that. And yeah, I understand there was a bit of a situation where he was smoking a little marijuana in the van and it didn't go over so well. <laughs> You know the story better than I do. Well, <laughs> he was 17 years old. As a kid, he approached me at that time. He had uh, uh, a school, and he said he wants to be a wrestler. He, of course, his name is Roderick Toombs. Anyway, I was charging $40 uh, a month to be trained and, and so forth. This kid, he gave me $10 down payment, and now I never see another time after that. But beside the point, I spotted him a mile away. He had good talent. He was a good talker, blah, blah, blah. So I trained him. Took me about a year to do that. Uh, these days, they take a kid uh, out of the streets to put him in a ring for three months. And of course, he's a professional wrestler. Bullshit. You, know, you never learn anything in three months, believe me. The only time you're going to really learn is when you go on the road. That's when your, your, your real training comes in. But anyway, in 1973, it was going to be his first match. Roddy, I didn't have a I didn't have a proper name for him, uh, a stage name. And one night, Roddy says, "Tony, I'm gonna be late for workouts." And uh, says, "Leave the ladies alone." I told the guy, right? <laughs> he says, "No, no, no." I says, "No, no, no." He says, "I'm taking music lessons." That's so sure you are. Sure enough, he comes back to the club a quarter to ten that evening, and me smartly says to him. You finish your music lessons. He said, you don't believe me, do you? I said, no, I do not believe you. He goes in his car and he brings in his bagpipes. He belonged <laughs> yeah. to a, he belonged to a, you know, a music club here in the city, right? I didn't know anything about that. So me looking at the guy, I said, can you play those things? Sure enough, you load them up and can sure play. He says, listen, June fifth. <clears throat> excuse me, June fifth is going to be your first match, and you're working against me. I says. I haven't got a proper name for you, but I'm going to give you one right now. Be be 
of course, his name is Roderick Sakomaradi, right? Because the pipes are Komaradi Piper. So you're crazy. I don't want to do that. I said, so all you got to do is walk up to the ring, play this bad pikes, and come in and don't worry about it. But he knew how to wrestle, uh, you know, villain or baby face, and he was really good at it. And uh, I went in the ring first, and uh, that time we drew 980 people here in one, uh, some local, oh, uh, the Native Club, that's what it was on River, it doesn't exist anymore. But anyway, uh, I noticed that the people were really booing the guy. Anyway, I kicked the shit out of that kid, right? <laughs> I went over one, two, three, and that was it. Anyway, after that, after that, he uh, did a few matches for El Tomko and all that stuff, right? And as he said, again, you know, he's, he's, he's passed away already, God rest his soul. But he lied all the way through where he came from. He forgot his roots. He said his first match was with Larry Henning in Minneapolis, blah, 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 right? But beside the point, I don't need any glory, but, you know, he made all the money, not me, right? I mean, uh, but he told me one thing. What do you want to be in life? He said, I want to be a movie actor, and I want to work for a big company, which he did. He became an actor. I've not seen some of his movies. It was pretty good, really. And uh, like I said, he was a, was a hell of a drawer, that man. And of course, going to the road, we'll go back now a little bit in time, going to the road in Manitoba, he had a habit. One habit he had, he smoked marijuana. I told him, listen, I'm not a stiff in the mud. He could smoke marijuana. I said, all you want, but not in the car while we're driving. Because those days, he used to get stuff with the RCMP, and what they used to do is put their nose inside the car, see if you can smell it, then you're in trouble, right? So he's, we're driving, and he's smoking back in the car. I said, look. Stop that goddamn garbage right now. If you want to smoke, you sure ask me. Stop the car, go in a bush, because there's a whole bush up there, mm-hmm. and smoke your head off. He says to me, who the hell do you think you're telling me you're my father or something? I said, stop this goddamn car. We went outside, we had it. He was pretty good with his fist. <laughs> I got cut up, and he gave, but anyway, he got a good licking again. But then we met up. We met up on the road, right? So then a year later, he says to me, he says, Tony, can you do me a favor? I said, if I can, why not? So I'm engaged to be married. I think that was back in 1974, 1975. And that lady, she was Miss Manitoba that year. She says, I don't know what to do. Get married or hit the road and become famous. She says, kiddo, I cannot answer that question. It's up to you. He did leave without telling his girlfriend and anything like that. His fiance, that is. And he went to, uh, I believe he started, uh, where did he start now? Uh, I forgot the name. But anyway, he did become famous. And back in 1982, that's when he started becoming famous because Vince McMahon started taking everything over. And he used that name, Roddy Roddy Piper. Whatever you did, made him famous. There you have it. That's Roddy Piper for you. But I met his son. And in Winnipeg, they, 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 they wrote a book about him, and uh, I went to see his son. He had about 100 people listen to the, the, the story of his father. I let him do his speech, of course. I don't want to interrupt anything, but at the end, I approached his son. I never met him before. I says, uh, you told the people here that this book is true. No false comments. I says, you're wrong, kiddo. Your dad wrestled me for his first match he ever had, June 5th, 1973. He says, are you Tony Condello? He says, yeah, I am. Well, says, I'm sorry, but that's what my father told me, right? But anyway, that was the end of that. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Was there ever any nights you decided to take up Hot Rod and smoke a joint with him, or was that not your persuasion so much? No, I never smoked marijuana in my life. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't <laughs> say that. No, I shouldn't say that. Now you, you clear my mind. Only once, the ring guy, the ring boys used to assert my ring, right? Yeah. Ah, come on, Tony, have a puff. Up. So to play their roles, okay, give me that stupid thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I had about six, seven puffs. You know what? I got sick. Oh, I no. was vomiting. I'm serious. I got vomiting. I didn't know where I was. And that was the end of, that was the end of my uh, trip to <laughs> this marijuana. <laughs> 
No, fair enough. I mean, I'd probably do the same thing if I was in a similar position. But I mentioned in the intro about your time with mixed martial arts and stuff like that, with Ultimate Cage Wars really laying the groundwork for the Manitoba MMA scene in a lot of ways. And I've interviewed Christoph Soshinsky, and we've talked a bit about that. Like, when did you get into promoting mixed martial arts? Like, how did that all initially come about? And, like, when did the talks kind of start? Was Christoph or not? for a couple of years I actually we thought of everything there was and then I sent them to Calgary uh, to learn about the karate and all that stuff with uh, Bad News Brown Bad, Bad, Bad News Allen right he was there for a couple of months I guess his intention he went to go to mixed martial arts right but anyway uh, they talked me into it the, him and the guy named Don Callis is Tony why don't you bring in mixed martial arts because uh, he's never, he's never, never been here. Mixed martial arts in Manitoba, right? That's a good idea. But anyway, I said, okay, I'll make it happen, and I did. I approached the that time we had boxing, uh, boxing commission. I asked them if they want to uh, license the event. They said to me, uh, do they wear, uh, do they wear boxing gloves? I said, no, they don't. Well, it's, it's out of a jurisdiction. So I used to sanction the event myself uh, with the rules of uh, uh, the big ones. What do you call them? Uh, well, the mixed martial arts. Where the, 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 it's, it's only one right now. Oh, the big promotion? UFC. UFC, exactly. Uh, don't mind me, I'm getting too bloody old. I keep forgetting things sometimes. But anyway, uh, I, I, I uh, promoted under the same regulation as they were using. And uh, I did that about three, four years, I believe. Brought in a lot of big names into Manitoba, and uh, uh, that was about it. Except one night, I had a lot of sponsor. I had a deal with uh, a station, uh, Fight Network. They wanted me to tape the uh, the episodes, and they're going to pay me for it, and blah blah blah. And uh, of course, I got about fifteen sponsors from from Winnipeg to put him inside the ring, right? It was extra money for me, right? For sure. One night, this guy, one of the, one of the commission, an idiot, of course, they're all a bunch of idiots. <laughs> uh, no, they are. They're, they really are. They don't try to promote, uh, to help the promoter. They play their role as they are the authority and you do exactly what they say or else. You know, that's the type of uh, idiot I used to, I used to uh, deal with. Guy comes along 10 minutes before the event and he says to me, he says, you got to take those logos off of the ring. I said, what the hell are you talking about, man? Those are worth 15 goddamn thousand dollars to me. I said, you want to take them off? I said, why you, you want, why you want to take them off? They might sleep and hurt themselves. That's what kind of an idiot commission that I had. Oh. So to save face, I made a mistake. I made a one mistake. I sort of said to him, here's that microphone. You tell the people, 4,500 people here, that you're going to cancel them because they're going to tear you apart, okay? But I didn't. I took the logos off. I took I took the bath, of course. The following week, I call a meeting with them. As you know what, guys? You are the commission. And, you, and it says, don't mind, don't mind exactly what I'm going to say, but I'm going to tell you. There's three of you. Three idiots that I have as a commission. I quit. I want my bond back and go fuck yourself. Plain English. My, 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 my expression. And remember <laughs> this. After I quit, there will be nobody else that's going to promote mixed martial arts in Manitoba. Nobody else. Except once the UFC came here, they cleaned up the town. They, they cleaned up about $3 million worth of money and they took off and never come back. And that was the end of the mixed martial arts. Now, I told them, remember, no more free tables for you guys at ringside plus your friends. No more meals for you with your friends at the event. And no more commission. They used to, they, we, we, they used to take 5% off the top for them. What do they do for a promoter? Zero. And today they have zero anyway. So there you have it. That's the commission. I did that about four years. I think I believe it was about four years. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because it seemed like the regulatory hurdles back then were 
really difficult. But I mentioned at the beginning of the interview your amateur wrestling background and certain things like that. So was it cool to be promoting this like, you know, shoot oriented kind of thing and just with it being an outlaw kind of controversial sport back then? Like what was what was all of that like? I'd imagine it would be pretty thrilling, just regulatory headaches aside. Well, the only problem I had with one of the counselors, one of the counselors here in, uh, in Winnipeg, state, stating that it's uh, brutality, this, this, and that, blah, 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 right? And I hit back at him. I said, yeah, well, what are you doing as a counselor? You're brutality yourself, I says. This is a sport. That's what it is, I says. What is football? Is not uh, all the you know all the bums that they take. What about boxing? What about the you know? I got him over the barrel, right? So shut him up. Yeah, absolutely. And just you know, going back to the pro wrestling stuff. I mean, like in MMA, like some of the names you had were fantastic. Like guys like you know Chris Hordesky and Jonathan Goulet and Jason McDonald. Just really reads like a who's who for the Canadian MMA scene. But a similar sentiment can go for the pro wrestling end of it. Like I was noticing Kenny Omega was on a tour there in the early part of 2004 in Manitoba. How cool is it to just see like all these different generations of talent develop and you're kind of at the nucleus of a lot of that growth. Is that something you think about much and frame in those terms or not so much? Well, it's, uh, Kenny Omega and Edge and Christian and Rhino, Lance Storm, all those Chris Jerk, they were all up there with me oh, yeah. in the winter tours. And uh, I could spot them a mile away that there's people that had all kinds of talents, right? And uh, that's why they made it, because the, the, for what they learned from me, I told them, I says, listen, when you get lucky or you get, you're going to get hired by some big promoter, which at that time was Vince McMahon, remember five things. Vince McMahon or anybody else that's up there is not Tony Condello that is friendly with you and you drive with me. You've probably never seen Vince McMahon in, in, in person, you, you know, face by face. He keeps away from the rest of what That's the real thing, what a, a, a guy like Vince McMahon should do. I'm not putting him down because that's the way it is. Uh, he stays away from the rest of He's got agents all over the place and so forth. But before you, after you leave me, remember five things. Five things is, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. What time you want me to be at the arena? Do your stuff in the ring and mind your own business. Now, if you're good and a guy likes you, it'll make you a millionaire. And how true that is. If you don't, he'll spit you out like a piece of gum. He's got no time for bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, totally. And that's definitely great advice. But you mentioned the dynamic of guys getting to be in the van with you and stuff like that. And obviously a wealth of experience with promoting, but also in AWA and whatnot, working with guys like, you know, Larry Hennig and Nick Bockwinkle and Bobby Heen. And I imagine a lot of the guys in the vans and stuff like that were really like under the learning tree and just like really taking the time to, you know, get some wisdom from you and just pick your brain. Those were the guys, Nick Bockwinkle. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wrestled him once. Lansdowne, North Dakota. I went there to uh, to referee some events for the AWA, really. And Mad Dog Varshan, he was in charge of the event. Uh, yeah, Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam War. Where year was that? Do you remember? For, Vietnam. For which, sorry? Vietnam War. What year was it? Oh, I'm not sure off the top of my head, admittedly, actually. Was it in the 60s or what? I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, sixty. Yeah, but yeah. But anyway, the funny part with this event was everybody. I looked in the crowd; is all ladies, no men. I wonder why, right? Because of the Vietnam War, there was no men around, right? Yeah. But anyway, Mad Dog Bashan was in charge. He says, "Hey, kiddo," he says, uh, uh, "We're short one wrestler. Instead of you refereeing, can you wrestle?" I say, "Yeah, sure, no problem." And they gave me this dude, Nick Be Nick Bockwinkle. So he comes up and approaches me. He says, Tony, he says, Tony, what can you do? I said, what would you like me to do? Can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I did all my background. I said, no problem. He says, follow me. So the match should have went six minutes. It was a house show, right? Yeah. Anyway, I says, uh, Bockwinkle says, we're already over five minutes. He says, don't worry about it, kiddo. Keep going. He liked the match, right? We did a hell of a performance. Anyway, he went 19 minutes with me on a 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes uh, time limit. And now what's going to happen is going to get shit from Vern, right? Yeah. <laughs> he says, don't worry about him. 
So what he told him, he says, look, the match was great. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> I love that. That's a, that's a cool story for sure. But I mean, I'm talking about the Northern Death Tour and just, it really took on a life of its own. Like it eventually had this huge identity and was a rite of passage for a lot of Canadian wrestlers and also on an international level. I mean, promoters from Japan giving you calls to help groom talent and stuff like that. Was there, a, was there like a distinct point where you noticed like the tour started developing this huge identity and kind of was taking on this life of its own? Most of the wrestlers uh, didn't believe that I had to uh, cross cross driving as they call the winter winter roads uh, frozen frozen lakes and so forth bush and so forth there was a challenge they never seen before and i had a call even from japan and they were going to pay their own way here and just to see the norton lights believe it or not but anyway uh, that's where you actually it's not an easy trip believe me uh, i i said to myself anybody can, that will make this type of trips that I've been going to, this Norton tourist, they can wrestle for anybody. And how true that is. They learn a lot to these guys. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, sometime, you know, you have a couple hours uh, to waste and they train in the ring and and so forth. It's a mind game because uh, there you drive, uh, you drive uh, 15 hours sometime at that time. Now it's easier because they made the roads much better. And when you get there now to the to the reservations, if somebody dies, they cancel you out. And I believe it was Christian or or um, Edge. They named uh, they named uh, the tour the death tour <laughs> because when we got there, somebody died, and they cancel you out. You, you cannot wrestle, right? That's the, the chance that you and they still is today. Uh, the chance that you take traveling. But they treat us like kings up there, believe me. They, all those people up north, all the reservation, I'll tell you, uh, they were waiting for to see some action in their community. And, of course, the, the speech to the kids, you know, we gather the kids in, uh, in a school gym all together. We talk about, you know, stay in school, stay away from drugs and all that stuff. They love that. Yeah, and I've actually lived in certain remote northern communities and stuff like that. And I've seen also, you know, some footage of the tour and, stuff like that and it's just such an amazing thing because like not as much entertainment comes through those areas obviously and you can see it in just the euphoria of people in the crowd and stuff like that like i mean imagine places like oxford house have to have like a special place in your heart over the years they sure have we actually talking about oxford i was just talking to them this morning oh nice what's going to happen well just see what's going to happen in february because with this COVID, you know you probably they're going to cancel you out you know what i'm saying but there's only uh, three cases in Oxford House that they told me, and uh, so forth. The, the uh, it's not that many up there, right? Maybe two or three, whatever. But you know, this blood disease spreads like uh, wildfire. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, plus the uh, couple of years back, they made a documentary about my Norton tour, which was very successful. Yeah. Uh, the last one was, uh, I don't know, three, four years ago, whatever. They made another one, and uh, me joking around to the cameraman and the producer says, why don't you enter this thing into some competition? They did. I think it was Vancouver Film Festival or Calgary, one of the two. I think it was Vancouver. So I win first prize in the documentary. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it's some great stuff, though. Like, I've seen the... Well, the documentary I saw was like mid two thousands kind of thing. It was like different guys like Chi Chi Cruz and certain guys like that on the tour and whatnot. So yeah, just like a great show that's created just an amazing litany of talent over the years. All kinds of talent. I even had the Baron von Rusk up there. I love that. And uh, that guy was a soldier and a half. I remember one time we broke down on the road this winter winter roads and. We're stuck, cannot move. And I had to phone in uh, Garden Hill. I saw, uh, anyway, they flew in an alternator <laughs> 650 loads later. Yeah. And he and, uh, in, in, in landed on, on, on one of those uh, lakes and so forth. But uh, Baron Varaska, ah, don't worry, guy, we won't freeze today. It took an axe that I had, of course, you got to go there uh, with all the equipment that you might require, right? Start chopping trees and blah blah blah. Put a little bit of gas over those trees, and 
the way we went, build a big fire until the plane came. Unbelievable. Then I got, I had a guy named Scott Norton. Ken Petura gives me a call. He says, Tony, I'm going to give you a guy that he says, uh, uh, put him through. He says, don't give no favors to this guy. He says, uh, he's uh, tuning up to go to Japan. I said, okay, fine. Comes to Winnipeg the first night. He's uh, playing the big shot and uh, in a bear parlor there in a, in a bar, buying everybody drinks. Anyway, I borrowed the guy $450. Actually, Ken Petur says, do not pay him no more than $450 per week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But anyway, the one night he's broke. <laughs> he didn't even start, he didn't even wrestle once yet. And I advanced him 450 bucks and he's broke. I said to myself, I'm going to fix this goddamn dude, right? <clears throat> so we're in the big lake. I stopped my van as his guys were stuck. I see, look in front of my van. I says, there's water running over the lake. So the, 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 the lake broke. Now we cannot go back. We can go for, forward. The chances are we're all going to die. And this guy here, as big as he is, he was crying inside the van, saying goodbye, saying goodbye to his family and so forth because he believed it. I was playing just a rip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, I, I, I figure I better not tell this guy the truth. That was just a rip. He might break my bloody back, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. Then at the end of the story was the last match of the evening. We were in, uh, I believe it was Garden Hill. I forgot what it was now. One of those reservations. We had a sellout crowd, right? So because he blew his money, he says to me, he says, Tony, so I have to talk to you. I said, what's the problem? He says, well, you got a big crowd here, you know, I need more money. I said, my deal with you, I said, my friend is $450. And that's it. And that comes from your boss, I guess. He's the guy who booked your campatura. Well, he said, I don't, I, that's, that's the case. I'm not going to wrestle. I said, no problem, sir. Because he believed in his mind that was him that drew that crowd. No, how wrong he was. It's the word wrestling that drew that crowd, not him. Nobody knew who he was. But anyway... Says no problem. Uh, just sit down and enjoy enjoy the, the evening. Then he thought about it and he wrestled anyway. And that was him, crybaby. You mentioned certain ribs on the road, though, and obviously there's the infamous Jethro Hog pig prank that was pulled on you. Are there any other ribs you remember over the years that were especially memorable on the death tour? I imagine there's a couple. They used to rip me every night, my friends. Really, <laughs> it is one of them every night. One, one, one of them is the Jetler Hog. He had a pig, right? His pet pig. He spring to the ring, right? I said, "Take this goddamn pig away from me! He stinks like a pig," yeah. which he did, right? <laughs> but anyway, we we're sleeping in the school gym. I got my little corner there, and him, Jetler Hog, and now and Don Callis and a couple other boys. They set me up. They wait, wait until I fall asleep. <coughs> so they put a. a uh, a trail of cookies right to my crotch or my sleeping bag, right? Yeah. So anyway, they let the pig, they let the pig loose. What is going to do? He's going to eat, eat the, the, the cookies all the way through my crotch, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I, in my sleep, I, I heard something, but, you know, I went back to sleep. Anyway, what happens now? They put a, tra a trail of cookies right to my face where I was sleeping. Now I open my eyes, and I scared the shit out of myself, really. I see a pig right in front of my face, right? <laughs> yeah, I chased him with a hockey stick all night long. Now I look in the mirror in the washroom, I got them, my, my hair was yellow. They put some color spray on my head, right? That's God damn it, the goddamn pig pissed on me, right? Yeah. And they're laughing their ass off, right? Whatever. That's one of the ribs. Yeah, I imagine that was a way to keep the morale going, too, just as people were going on the tour and stuff like that and, you know, making meals in the different, like, repurposed kind of rec rooms and, like, the schools and stuff like that. Like, just a good way to keep everyone on the level and just have a good time. Exactly, yeah, because it's not, like I said, it's not a I enjoy, I enjoy a trip in a sense, right? But it is in the other sense. Yeah, yeah, it's cooking all meals. They have a good facility in the schools. They have the... 
kitchens, uh, showers, and all that stuff, right? So it's perfect in, in the schools, eh? Oh, yeah, definitely works out for sure. And you mentioned having Baron Von Raschke on a prior tour. I also noticed that Gene Kaniski actually was asked to wrestle a match, and that ended up being his last match. So that must be a cool sort of feather in the cap and a distinction there. That time was, uh, of course, uh, Joey Yellow was my announcer here locally uh, in Winnipeg for the wrestling, uh, which he got hired by Vince, actually, but uh, at that time, uh, through Nick Buckwinkle, that is. But he did not take the contract because at the same time, he was, gonna, he was engaged to be married, and uh, he didn't want to go on the road because he knew all about it, right? What was, you know, what's involved, and instead he got married, right? But anyway... Uh, Nick Buckwinkle says, Tony, and uh, I said, you need a uh, special guest referee for this type of event. We're taping for TV, right? I said, like who? I said, Jim Kaniski. Jim Kaniski. Yeah, he gave me his number. I phoned him. Tony says, because I uh, brought Jim Kaniski to Winnipeg once for just signing autographs for our shopping center. So he knew who I was. I said, Jim, don't charge me so much money because uh, there is no money. He only charged me $500, believe it or not, plus his plane fare, whatever. Because him and Nick Buckley were close friends, right? So we were, we were doing the taping, and Gene is putting his boots on to referee the event. And uh, Buckley will say, Tony, go to Gene, ask him if he wants to wrestle instead of uh, referee. And I did. He spotted me He spotted me a mile away. He said, who told you that, Nick? I said, yeah. And he wrestled. Uh, he wrestled uh, that time we had Chris Jericho on the card and plus other names, right? And that was his last match. Poor guy dies on me later on, right? I still got that on tape. I got 300 one-hour tape. 300 one-hour tape, which I blew over a million dollars for those tapes. And one time, uh, uh, I still got his match, of course, in the in the tape. I uh, guess I'm in the, in the process of transfer the tapes to three quarters and because uh, they're in three quarters and beta, but I got to, you know, got to transfer them to the, the right material they used today for television. And uh, Vince McMahon wanted to buy them once for me and uh, he offered me $150,000, right, for the whole thing after I blew a million dollars, right? Yeah. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your, for your offer. Uh, thank you for your offer, but no thanks. I would prefer to throw them in the garbage than give it to him for 150000 <laughs> Really? Well, I think you should... That doesn't, mean I, that doesn't mean I could not use 150000 right? No, I get what you mean. I know what, yeah. I know what he paid for the rest of the promotion, in the, in the minions, right? When you look at the tape library you have, and just we've been talking about all the talent that have come through there, like it definitely is valued more than that for sure but also like we were talking a bit before about how a lot of this is like people coming out to see wrestling and it's like their first exposure to seeing live wrestling in some instances and i was seeing in that you know mid-2000s documentary there that some of the people on the reserve will be seeing like people once a year like some of these performers only a single time through the calendar year but they have like this intimate recall and they're so passionate about it like what like have you seen any distinct instances of like people showing their fandom that have really resonated with you because that seems like a very powerful thing these remote communities only getting like a show once a year and it's like this memorable thing yeah what's well, noise though hang on those people never forget every time i go there they welcome me every time every year and especially those kids now they're growing up, but they do remember. They do remember exactly what's happening. They remember their names, and they even got pictures with them as a kid, right? Not today, they're growing up, eh? They're unbelievable fans, that's all I'm going to say with them. They're unbelievable fans up north. I love hearing that, man. That's such a cool thing, but you've been really good with your time. and I mean, I could pick your brain all afternoon, but I did want to be mindful of your schedule, man. So is there anything you'd want to add as a parting thought as we're wrapping up here, Tony? Well, I'm glad for those uh, people that are out there. They've made a big, right? Like Edge Christian, Chris Jericho, all those guys. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, no, that was their dream, and the dream came through. Most of them, you know. 
for some of them, you know, they they still retired or whatever, but they never made it because they didn't want to listen, right? Know what I'm saying? Those five, six guys that met a huge, uh, today they're millionaires, and they listened and they did their thing. I said, it's all about. Yeah, is there like a distinct case over... Sometime, like, uh, uh, a wrestler from uh, Vince McMahon, he's way up there, and all of a sudden he's not there any longer because they don't do their job. Yeah. Yeah, are there... I remember the Ultimate Warrior, remember him? Oh, for sure. Hey. Eh? Oh, definitely, yeah. I remember Ultimate Warrior. Well, what happened to him? The same thing. If he didn't listen, he got fired, then the poor guy died, right? Were there any times... My friend? Yeah, I mean, I loved getting all those insights from you, man, and just was great getting to pick your brain a little bit. So thank you for making the time, Tony, and just I hope you enjoy the rest of your day as well there, man. It's my pleasure, my friend, to talk to you. Maybe we'll talk, uh, maybe we'll talk again. Yeah, I would like that, man. I appreciate that. You have a good one. Yeah, you too, sir. Thank you.